Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I am your co-host, Mark Bigney, once again without Michael Walker, who is continuing to be an exemplary stroke recovery patient. More details and news to be following soon. But in the meantime, I am blessed with another exceptionally gifted, talented, and generous co-host who cannot fill in for Michael Walker because nobody can, but he will absolutely do credit to So Very Wrong About Games. He is one-fourth or one-third, depending on how math works on a given week, (laughs) of Board Game Barrage. He's the green tank, and he is also the most generous man in the entirety of the Southwest who gives hospitality a sterling reputation. With me is Mark Basada. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing great. Uh, I think at least I can double the Mark level on the show just by my very name. So there's that's not quite a, a mic, that's, but uh, it's something, I think. <laughs> well, given how frequently people call me Mike and call him Mark, uh, won't be much of a change, but I can aspire, at least for my part, to be one of the two best Marks in board gaming podcasting <laughs> right now on this show. I, I share that aspiration. I share that aspiration. Okay, well... With those lofty goals in mind, let us talk about board games. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And we're going to have a bit of a throwback to back when we did both a feature game and a topic here on So Very Wrong About Games. We're going to be talking about Captain Flip, but more broadly, we're going to be talking about the Spiel des Jahres, the German Game of the Year award, which did not go to Captain Flip. But anyway, we'll be talking about Captain Flip at any rate. So with that in mind... We are moving on to games we played last week, and I'm going to get started, and I'm going to Wait, talk... Wait, uh, didn't you promise me a, a two-hour sports segment at some point? I thought that was the reason why you brought me on the show, to increase the uh, the sports uh, Well, that's all we've got time for this week for so <laughs> Around About Games. Thanks for joining me, Mark. Now get out and never come back. <laughs> Look, when and if I'm able to track down a good copy of Subutio, or Subuteo, or however people pronounce it, yeah. that is the closest we will come to sports ball on this august show deal deal i'll take that so i got to play sky tier horde monoliths this is the solo slash co-op tower defensey decky thing by giacomo neri and ricardo neri at sky tier games and i'm coming to terms with uh two very comfortable conclusions one of them is that i'm very very pleased to have passed on the most recent round of crowdfunding in which Skyter Games once again wanted to ask far too many euros for what is essentially a bunch of cards. I'm not saying it's overpriced, but I'm saying it was more than I was willing to pay. But at the same time, I'm really coming to appreciate the tremendous variety of content that I already have. And that's a good place to be. I've been trying to grow as a gamer, fight off the FOMO, fight off the completionist urges, and games like Skyter Horde Monoliths have been a very, very good route to that. And I'll just pretend like my collection of too many bones makes a lot of sense. Just don't bring that up. So Skytier Horde Monoliths remains exactly what I want it to be, and the faction differentiation is actually kind of surprising, because in the base set there were four different factions based off of four different colors, and it's very derivative of Magic the Gathering and other kinds of card games of that ilk where you're fighting your 2-4 against an opponent 3-2, etc., the kind of stuff we've been doing for years. But nonetheless, there were an interesting sort of set of tricks that various decks had. My favorite was the yellow deck, And they got stronger based on how many cards were in your discard pile, which was kind of a risk-reward mechanism by virtue of the fact that you could auto-lose if your deck ran out of cards. And to that end, indeed, the minions would strip cards off the top of your deck. But the new yellow deck doesn't work on that mechanism at all. It instead introduces new tricks. And so... I do. I really am appreciating some of the design work and the asymmetry of Skytier Horde monoliths, even though I can't say overall that there's any stunning originality in what's going on, which is fine because it's a very fast-playing, breezy solo game in which the AI is trivial to execute, and it lets you focus on the relative parsimonious number of card plays you'll get to, you'll get to do. But in a game of that duration, I find it perfectly acceptable. So. I don't think I'll be re-upping on any more Skytier Horde products going forward, especially given their existing pricing structure. But the recently fulfilled Monoliths, which is the second set, continues to please. And so if solo gaming is your thing and you're able to find it on a relatively cheap price and or if you've been desperate, like I kind of was. Desperate's a bit of a strong term, but I was very keen for Epic, for example, when it came out, to, for it to have a robust solo mode. All these kinds of magic derivatives. There's lots of really good solo deck builders, but a solo... Magic derivatives I've found not particularly uh, uh, 
prevalent in the board gaming sphere. And so Sky Tier Horde was exactly what I wanted it to be, and I'm very happy with what I've got, and I don't think I will be expanding any further, but it's exactly the kind of quick-to-setup, quick-to-play thing that I like having in my arsenal as an occasional solo gamer. And so that's my further experience with Sky Tier Horde, specifically the Monoliths set. I see here that Monoliths is a standalone expansion to the original Sky Tier Horde. I wasn't familiar with with Monoliths. Uh, and you also you mentioned that there was a yellow deck in the previous uh, previous uh, Sky Tier Horde and a yellow deck in Monoliths. Does that indicate that they're not sort of compatible with each other? Are they like two different kinds of yellow decks, or or how do the what's the connection between the two games? Is, is this basically just an expansion? So it's an expand alone, and right. right. It's the kind of modular game where you select an adversary and you select your own deck and there are some other things like you, you get a castle and you get a you pick the boss. And so the boss and the adversary don't have to be linked. And there are, as of now, pre the latest Kickstarter, uh, rather GameFound campaign, is Kickst- I feel like Kick- Kickstarter is becoming a genericized, uh, kind yeah. of like Kleenex. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, there are now eight different faction decks that you can play as. And that, for me is going to be the key area of asymmetry. I always focus on, you know, new heroes, new characters, new decks for you to play as when getting bang for your buck in terms of variety. Unfortunately, it's it's a good thing you called out the yellow decks because the yellow decks were the crowdfunding exclusives for both campaigns. The retail versions of both Sky Tier Horde and for Sky Tier Horde Monoliths do not have yellow decks. You, those see. are only available separately. And so if you get the base game box for either the base set or for monoliths, and again, they, they're perfectly ready to go as complete standalone experiences, you're quote unquote only going to have three different complete decks for your heroes, for your own characters, and for your own effects, and then some smattering of enemies and so forth. So if you go all in on the retail arm, currently what you're going to get is six available decks. I was uh, particularly keen on Sky Tier Horde when I first tried it, so I did trade for a deluxe version of the original set. Uh, but I don't know if in terms of actually shelling out the money, again, like the pricing on the entire line is just kind of on the edge for me about it being worth it. So yeah. I don't know that I could recommend someone going all in in that way. If you can get it in trade, that's great. If you want to try the base game and you can get a good price, I'd suggest that too. But past that, it's it's very much a, a try before you buy kind of scenario. I see. I got a chance to play Lords of Scotland. This is uh, a game that came out in 2010, designed by Richard James. Uh, the version I played was, uh, again, an older older version, the original version, published by Z-Man Games. I know it's been republished and uh, sort of prettied up recently, fairly recently, 2015, by Z-Man. So the uh, the version I played with is the older, sort of uh, much more generic-looking edition. Lords of Scotland uh, is, a, is a hand management game. I was sort of surprised when I looked it up on BGG. It's a, a 1.93 weight rating for whatever that's worth but uh, feels to me like a like an even lighter game uh, basically what you're doing in, in Lord of Scotland is, is there are five rounds you can be playing cards trying to have the highest score based on the uh, the number on your cards um, but the twist is you can play your cards in front of you in one of two ways you can either play them face down making the amount the value of your cards secret so your opponents don't know sort of what number you're currently at uh, to try to win the the cards in the like kitty the pile or you can play them face up the trade-off for playing them face up is if you if the value of the card you're playing is the lowest or tied for the lowest of any card that's currently currently been played that round you get to activate some specific power that is on the card powers are unique to the clans which are sort of equivalent to suits and there's also a further twist where as you're playing these cards again try to get the highest number if Every card you play in front of you um, is of the same suit, of the same clan. The value is doubled. So um, so that's that's what, what you're doing. You're, the um, rounds, each round is, is basically five plays where you're either, again, playing out cards in front of you for score. There's also a shared array of cards between you and your opponents where uh, that you can, instead of playing cards in front of you, take a card from the pile, from the array, um, to you know, strengthen your your hand of cards for further rounds. You keep doing this until somebody hits um, a, a value of uh, a, a victory points, and uh, and that's that's all there is to Lords of Scotland. Uh, this was my first time playing it. Uh, we were because it's, it's so quick and so sort of simple to teach and and play. Uh, we were able to run a couple games back to back, and I really enjoyed it. Um, it has that feeling of games that you would play with you know non quote unquote gamers in your family where it's very simple to teach i don't know what the equivalent would be to you know it certainly doesn't feel like a hearts or something like that but 
again, you're just basically playing cards for points. The only the complicating factor is this this power system, but even that is is pretty straightforward. There's nothing very complicated about it, and so made me realize uh, why it was worthy of worthy being a, a loaded word uh, being reprinted, and uh, can definitely see myself getting a copy of it. Uh, and a game I'd recommend, you know, for people who want a you know a, an e- easy game to teach for for people that uh, that may not be you know quote unquote again hardcore gamers uh, to to whip out and play. So that's uh, Lords of Scotland. It sounds like a less hobbyist version of Capital Lux. I've heard about Lords of Scotland before, and it it, it sounds a little bit like that structure. Yeah, yeah, I would say I would say that's a good good uh, analogy for sure. Well, glad you enjoyed Lords of Scotland. I've heard it mentioned off and on over the years, and it certainly seems to have uh, its its defenders. Richard James is regarded by some people in my acquaintance as one of those designers who designs games that are superficially trivial, but in point of fact, they tend to have more meat than is initially apparent. So. Yeah, I wasn't very familiar with with a lot of his work. Uh, I played uh, Court of the Medici uh, before and and enjoyed that. So yeah, I think I think that is a a good assessment of his of his work. Yeah, and and a game that certainly uh, just nice to have games that are very like, again very simple to teach and, and quick to play without a lot of setup and a lot of explanation. So uh, always happy to have those kinds of games in my collection. Yeah, your gatekeeping has been well and duly noted. So <laughs> I got to play another round of Slay the Spire, the board game. This is an Insta Eurus. We reviewed this last week here on So Very Wrong About Games. This is the board game adaptation of the video game by Anthony Giovanetti and Casey Yano. The board game adaptation is also credited by with Gary Doretsky of Contention Games. And I got to play this with one Michael Walker. Michael Walker is a big fan of Slay the Spire, and I'm always very curious to expose Slay the Spire to people who are either A, well-versed in Slay the Spire, or B, who have never played it before. So it's always, you know, you always get interesting reactions from all of those groups. Uh, Walker has a very particular stance towards Slay the Spire, which is, as far as he's concerned, there is only one character, and that is the Ironborn, and all the other characters are made-up, non-existent ones. <laughs> and so as I was setting up, he very he looked over at Dewey and said, there are three available characters to choose from, at which point someone said, I thought there were four. He grabbed the Ironborn character and said, no, 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 <laughs> there are only three. This is the kind of thing that happens with Walker. Normally, we don't let him get away with it, but in the context of current events, we're more than happy to defer to him to a certain extent. <laughs> And this was another session of playing with four players. And you always have to be careful with co-ops. Sometimes the duration of a game scales linearly with the number of players. And sometimes that can make a game creak under its own weight. An example off the top of my head would be something like Street Masters. I'm a huge fan of Street Masters, pretty much of all the Sadler Brothers games. But once you get to the maximum player count, it really does start to be longer than it ideally wants to be. I'm still perfectly willing to play Street Masters at four, but it's not the ideal configuration. So I was a little bit nervous about... Uh, Slay the Spire, the board game. But as per some theory crafting that I've had with it earlier on, and something that we didn't mention in the review, the game does not scale linearly in duration with the number of players because there's effectively simultaneous play. It's one of those deck building games where you have monsters and enemies that are nominally in your lane, but you can target whomever you want, and the lane assignments only matter for what they're going to do to you, and you can just play cards simultaneously and just go ahead and do things. And all things being equal, that is a structure that I prefer with games of the ilk, especially when you've got hidden hands and everyone's just triggering their own effects. As much as I like games like Xenoshift, uh, it does tend to take a lot longer for everyone to go through every lane by themselves at a separate time. If you could do a simultaneous play variant, that is absolutely my preference. And we got through all of Chapter 1 in about 75 minutes, which is a great duration for something like that. A little bit too long for three chapters back-to-back, and perhaps a little bit too short for people who want to make it the main game in evening, but nonetheless a very manageable length, especially given that there were four of us. And so Slay the Spire continues to win friends, and despite the fact that it seems like, as I characterized it last week, the answer to a question no one asked, and possibly a cheap video game cash-in, I remain very, very impressed with the different design work that they did to bring it into physical form. I was playing as a character that I don't have much experience with in the digital game, And I was impressed at just, you know, exploring more of the design space and seeing the different asymmetries that emerge. And so I continue to be relentlessly delighted by Slay the Spire, the board game. I am uh, one of the, I think, few that are in sort of the video game slash board game world who have never played uh, Slay the Spire. And hearing you uh, talk about it uh, now and last week and in the past um, has, has certainly piqued my interest. The ability to play this cooperatively and to play it solo is something that has been appealing to me uh, recently as I've sort of moved into a 
uh, being more into playing solo games. It's a game that uh, seems to be sort of hard to get your hands on now, I think, because of how, how hot it is. And uh, it, I guess it just recently um, was uh, released to the people who, who purchased it on, on Kickstarter. But uh, yeah, one that I'm very, very interested in playing for sure. It is playable in digital form on more or less anything. And so if you can find a relatively cheap version, I would encourage you to give it a try. My concern, though, is that if I go digital with it, and I know that there have been changes, or I hear there have been enough changes between the two, uh, will I, you know, having played it digital, start playing it, you know, analog and think to myself, why am I not just playing it digital? You know, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's sort of a concern I have um, in the board game space with, with uh, Board Game Arena, frankly, is like, I, I sort of con- am concerned when I really like playing a game on Board Game Arena that it will, you know, make the analog cardboard version lose its luster for me. So it's something I'm always a little concerned about. If your primary interest in Slay the Spire is the solo application of it, that yeah. might be more prevalent. It's just the amount of joy that one gets through just the collaboration, the interface with different characters sure. and, and bring it all together. And and, and just, the, you know, the, the natural, almost inevitable joys of the co-op design space definitely justify it as a project, as I've made very clear. But if you're going to be playing it primarily solo and you're concerned about those pacing issues, I mean, my my recommendation would be to save the money, right? Slay the Spire digitally for five to six bucks, depending on which version happens to be on sale at any given time. And I don't think for solo only play, you're going to be missing all that much out. And besides, you've got an extensive solo collection anyway, because what is it? Uh, nobody likes you. <laughs> I guess um, something that I hadn't realized sharply primarily because I haven't played the uh, digital version is that there is no right there's no co-op digital version the co-op is Correct. a solo play yeah okay so yeah that would be a huge reason to to go with the the uh, cardboard version clearly and besides I, I apologize for that joke I would like to immediately issue an editorial correction it is not the case that nobody likes Mark Posada I am the only one that likes Mark <laughs> We apologize for the error. That's all I need, Mark. Uh, I got the <laughs> chance to speaking of speaking of playing games on BGA. I got a chance to play Distilled, uh, both in person and on BGA. Uh, Distilled is a game by David Beck and published by Paverson Games. Distilled is a game I know, uh, Mark, you and uh, Mike uh, talked about previously. I was charmed by the, the theme and how how lovingly the designer or you know the developer uh, worked the theme into the game. I, I will say, uh, I I was charmed by it despite the fact that i'm not a person who you know is really drawn to games about alcohol or drinks very much in general speaking of which hmm. mark do you do you know um the the word that comes from the latin word beer which means to drink and is an adjective that can that, that can describe someone who likes to drink alcohol do you know this word i will tell you <laughs> what the word is the word the word is bibulus bibulus so okay. uh, I, I say that uh, for no other reason than we're talking about an alcohol-related uh, game and no other fact, no other reason that I would say Biblius as much as I could on your show. But uh, anyhow, um, so I was... Uh, I, it's a good thing you're not talking about scripts and scribes because that was a terrible game. <laughs> <laughs> unrelated uh, remark. Uh, totally unrelated, totally unrelated. Uh, but uh, to be uh, to be serious, um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm not a person who, again, you know, generally uh, gravitates towards games about alcohol or winemaking or anything like that. Uh, and yet I found this charming. I found it like, you know, lovingly designed. It seemed like the, uh, the you know, people who behind it uh, really know or, or learned about the craft of, to my untrained mind, distilling spirits and stuff like that. And I liked the uh, the gimmick where you know uh, when you're distilling your spirits, I guess in in this spirit making, there is a part of it where you remove the the head and the tail of it, the the top of of the alcohol and the bo- and the and the dregs at the bottom, and that is mimicked by when you are making your your spirit in this game you take the top card you, you shuffle your cards you take the top one off take the bottom one off that seemed charming to me i i will agree with um uh, criticisms both you and other people have had that it, it can be the randomization can feel a little bit a little much and i think that this is very much a game where you want to f- figure out your path to victory which i think for me at least has been Find out what the end game goals are and sort of focus on that along with sort of what your character is specialized at. You, you sort of want to synergize that and sort of hammer it hard as possible. And that can feel limiting as well to some degree where you're like, okay, this is the path. I've got to do everything I can to go down this path. And also the fact that the player interaction is is, is quite limited. It's, it's as you said in a previous episode, um, you know, basically 
if you know that fruit is going to be the sugar that uh, you, that is the big sugar in this game based on how things have broken everybody's going to be going for the sugar the, the the fruit cards and that's where the sort of interaction comes from and yet despite all these things i found myself again charmed by it and and to the degree that i i have you know now played it again through bga primarily but also in person you know 10 15 times which is more than i can say for a lot of games and and continue to enjoy it i don't know i don't know what it is it's again it's one of these things where it's hard to describe uh, or or get at what it is that is keeps drawing me back i think it's a fairly simple game to to play it's it's not a game where i go back to it and i'm concerned that oh am i remembering all the rules let me just pull up a rule book and and go through this and try to remember if there's any small bit that i'm forgetting um so the simplicity along with the charm um has made distilled a game that uh that I, i keep going back to uh and that i've i've quite enjoyed it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, one thing that's that's worth mentioning, even in the context of my critiques that I stand by, if it is one of the many borderline multiplayer solitaire recipe fulfillment games yeah. that have been released in the past five years, if this is the one you like, that's fine, right? Like, it is sure, indeed, as you say, yes. somewhat charming. Like, whether or not you're interested in consuming alcoholic beverages or you like those drinks or whatever, or you're interested in the process of making them, I don't mean to imply that you're some sort of uh, bilious sort of over drinker. You see, that's a that's a Latin riff that I'm that I'm engaged in. <laughs> but if you find this one charming, that's an excellent reason to pick this one as opposed yeah. to the sixty other hobbyist recipe fulfillment games that you can go play. And that's entirely legit. And at that point, you're more willing to tolerate the weird randomness of the draw rather than it being the thing that says stay away from this one. And right, so correct, I'm glad yeah. you're you're getting some enjoyment out of it. Yeah, 10 to 15 plays is, is pretty substantial for a lot of the recent releases, and so I'm glad you're enjoying it. Absolutely. I get to play Relic Blade, the adventure battle game. So this is an indie miniatures game, and most of the indie tabletop miniatures games that I talk about tend to be the ones that are not connected to their own line of miniatures. So for example, uh, Gaslands and Horizon Wars being the two foremost instances, those are games that are very much designed to either encourage you to kit bash things in the case of Gaslands, or to encourage you to use miniatures you already have in the case of Horizon Wars, the various iterations thereof. And that's very much the aesthetic that I'm drawn to. That's very much the kind of tabletop miniatures hobby hobbyist gaming that I appreciate rather than just having a rule system that is in service of shoving more models i.e. the games workshop model and uh, now well formerly privateer press but now it's moving on into steamforge games setting all that aside then there are the other indie tabletop miniatures rules game rules sets that have their own miniatures lines I tend not to play those as a general rule, but Relic Blade is an example of one that is mentioned very highly in some of the circles in which I move. There is a line of miniatures that is to support Relic Blade, and the designer, Sean Sutter, is also a someone interested in selling his own minis. And some of them do indeed look kind of kind of neat. There's a whole bunch of pig men that are kind that have a certain degree of character. There's a squid-faced assassin or three that kind of look cool. I didn't end up playing with any of those minis, mind you, but it's just for context, that's where it's situated in the market. Relic Blade does a couple of things relatively well in the context of tabletop miniatures rule sets. One of them is that it allows you lots of interesting room for individual character customization. What do I mean by this? Well, in a lot of miniatures rule sets, the costing is such that it almost never makes any sense to buy toys for your existing units. It all, it all just makes more sense to buy more dudes. You're like, well, I could I could kit this individual dude with some new things, but really the way the point values shake out, it would be a waste of points and I should just sink it into more units and flood the zone with guys. And sometimes that's okay and sometimes it's a problem, but Relic Blade really does a good job of saying, look, we want you to customize these units with various little one-shot cards and little abilities and the costing works out very well and it leads to a lot of character and personality in terms of both the army building and in terms of actual play. Lots of big moves where you cash in the one-shot spell and a whole bunch of things happen and it's all very neat. And I appreciated that. You don't often find that in a lot of tabletop miniatures rule sets well done properly. The problem, though, is that it then falls into a, a certain dynamic that the Hanverker tends to call boys before toys. This is how he characterizes my approach to army building. I, I generally look at a tabletop miniatures rule set, or indeed any instance where I can customize my force, and say, why would I have six talented individuals when I could have 15 incompetents and flood the zone? And 
I think some rule sets are better at balancing this. Again, uh, in the Infinity Miniatures game does a really good job of, of balancing this based on its order system. But when I play Gaslands, when I play Horizon Wars, I tend to have mass and volume. And some systems are good at balancing this, and some miniature systems are not good at balancing this. And so far, our early impressions of the Relic Blade system is that it is not good at balancing this. Because despite the fact that you have these big, interesting heroes with lots of customizable abilities, they can and will go down in one shot. And if they can, we'll go down in one shot. Well, then why not just have twice as many incompetents as opposed to a small number of highly trained individuals, which tends to reduce the personality, tends to reduce the options involved, tends to increase the prevalence of high stakes die rolls, which are all many of the problems endemic in a lot of conflict games that don't have the level of balance and polish that you might otherwise want. And so while I, I appreciated a lot of the, the things that Relic Blade was doing, at the end of the day, the fundamental resolution system as interfacing with the fragility of units, I don't think quite gets it to where it wants to go. I think that, it, that, that the overall aesthetic and the overall game state that the, that the designer wanted would have been better served with slightly different damage valuations or slightly more hit points in the case of the units or more step losses. I don't know. I'm not in the business of fixing games. I'm in the business of complaining about games. <laughs> and so the Hanverker, on the other hand, is more intrigued by the underlying systems than I am. He wants to go past the theory crafting of our first game and really start to push the boundaries of these things and see if, if, if this can be messed with and or possibly resolved with some house rules. And so I'm probably going to end up playing Relic Blade again with him once or twice. And I am looking forward to it. Look, I'm not it, it was it was relatively well done in terms of the overall pacing, the scrum-like aspects that you find in a lot of tabletop miniatures games weren't particularly prevalent. It's just when the rubber hit the road, it was, you know, fluky one-shot kills that tended to be determinative, which in a small model game is not ideal. And then, of course, just encourages you to go to a more high model uh, system. Anyway, I have a lot more thoughts on tabletop miniatures rule sets. I'm probably going to save them for bloat because the core audience isn't necessarily here to talk if, to hear me talk about toy soldiers. And I was pleased to try Relic Blade. I've been wanting to try it for a while. In fact, bought the rule set a few years ago and found some of the concept interesting and probably more to follow. But as it stands, I don't think it necessarily reaches the top tier of such things of the designs of people like Mike Hutchison and Roby Jenkins. So that's the Relic Blade Adventure Battle Game designed by Sean Sutter and Metal King Studio, which is a very peak tabletop miniatures <laughs> game publisher name. <laughs> During the course of me, you know, exploring the board gaming world, there are a number of niche, niches that I have uh, found myself dipping my toe in and getting into. Whereas early on, I never thought I would be into them, like eighteen XX games and war games, and and now solo games is the latest niche that I'm I'm trying to get into. Uh, I've still not yet gotten into you know tabletop mini skirmishy sort of games. I, I feel like that is on the horizon. Um, and so, uh, I, I always look forward to, to hearing you talk about them. Um, I, I don't know though, if I know what your stance is or what your experience is with painting minis. Are you a big, um, <laughs> mini painter? I'm sure you've discussed it before and it just slipped my mind, but where do you stand on that? Uh, I, I, I used to paint miniatures, but life's too damn short. I don't like sure. arts and crafts. <laughs> I was the I kid in kindergarten that hated arts and crafts. I've never been adept or interested in anything remotely approaching the visual arts. This I right see. here, this is as cultured as I get. I don't do <laughs> culture past this. And so I, I, I did it briefly, very badly. And now I'm going to stage my life where I don't do it anymore. I have enough miniatures that I can proxy nearly anything. And anything I can't proxy, I ignore. Yeah. So <laughs> there are most people who engage in the tabletop miniatures hobby, they do the gaming part as ancillary to their arts and craft project. Right. And they play a game because they like the look of the units. And I completely respect that, but that's not the kind of hobbyist that I am. I do the game rules first, and the toys are a way of enabling the rules rather than the other way around. I represent a vanishingly small proportion of the tabletop miniatures enthusiasts. Interesting. I, I know that there are people who, um, maybe similar to you, are, are more into the game and, and will often hire out uh, artists to or painters to, to do that work. Um, but I, I didn't realize that uh, that that percentage, the ones who are more you know rules focused, um, is as as you sort of saying, are a, a smaller portion than the ones who are in it, perhaps for the uh, artistic or creative side of it. So interesting. Yeah, I, I used to hire people to paint things. There were a series of individuals, and point of fact, the reason why I refer to somebody locally as Chip the Third is because he is the third such individual that I, I have contracted out to, to to paint things. But 
The chips one and two, that way back in the day, they had a very, very bad estimation of their worth. You know, they would come <laughs> back, I, 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 they would paint like half a dozen figures immaculately and say, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe 30 bucks. I'd hand them 60 and say, you really got to do this better, man. Right. Uh, but <laughs> I haven't met anyone lately uh, that was particularly keen to be taking on commissions. Chip the Third does so on occasion, but out of kindness, I not see. out of out of out of requirement. Because it's look, if if you're not interested in doing it yourself, it's a long and thankless, arduous process. And again, it's mostly driven by hobbyist enthusiasts. And my enthusiasm is for rule sets, not for the painting yeah. part. So makes sense. I played Sky Team, which is, I guess, a nice lead into our our main topic. Uh, uh, as Sky Team recently just won the spiel. Um, so Sky Team, a cooperative game that I've played um, a number of times, uh, again, both in person and on BGA. This time I played it with my uh, girlfriend who is not uh, necessarily a quote unquote gamer, uh, but is interested uh, in the hobby. She's not a hobbyist. She's I mean, not a hobbyist. It's our editorial position here on So Very Wrong About Games that you do not adhere to, but you should at least uh, acknowledge or pretend to adhere to, uh, is <laughs> that if you play games, you're a gamer. It's just you might not be a hobbyist gamer. Much better, much better language for sure. She's always interested in in playing stuff that is, you know, perhaps lighter, just more accessible, which I completely understand. And we'll, I'll, I'll probably talk about this more when we talk about the spiels. But one thing that I found that people who are not hobbyists who are interested in gaming uh, is the idea that this, this game is up for, or in the case of Spiel uh, of Sky Team now has won the game of the year. That's always like a there. It, it generally piques interest. And so uh, uh, played with her. She had a, a great time. Um, I, I remember you talking about this uh, in one of your earlier reviews. Uh, it was you and Mike talking about uh, the, um, the the loss condition being everyone dies, the win condition being everybody stands up and cheers. And she remarked on that as well. I was trying to you know <laughs> give a little flavor to, to sort of draw her in uh, more to like make the enhance the experience we're having. And uh, she commented about sort of like you're saying that Either everyone dies or everyone loves us. I said, well, basically, that's what's going on. And uh, <laughs> and I just, I, I, you know, this has sort of been my uh, experience as I get into solo games. But I, I just, I love the idea that I'm not really into modules when it comes to multiplayer games for some reason. I, I, I Kellen, my co-host, has mentioned this. But there was some part of me that worries that I'm not playing the game the real way. Like, should we include this module? What is the way that the designer intended that's been, for whatever reason, a concern of mine? But it's nice when you have a solo game and you sort of you generally add these modules as you want to get more and more complicated or more and more difficult. And um, so that's one thing that I uh, really enjoy about solo games. And it's, it's, it was fun to take her sort of on this escalating, um, you know, ride as we went from the, the most basic version into more and more complicated airports. And uh, yeah, uh, had a had a fantastic time. Again, another very, very charming game. Uh, another one like Distilled, another uh, a game that was, is uh, relatively simple to teach. And not as not as simple as, say, Lords of Scotland, but uh, but simple and always always good to have. Um, you know, cooperative games that you feel that you can you can bring out and uh, and teach with with pretty much anyone, and that certainly fit the bill with Sky Team. So very much enjoyed that. Did you kill everyone? We we killed everyone most of the time. We occasionally <laughs> landed the plane. <laughs> But for the most part, uh, there were a lot of uh, fatalities, unfortunately. Um, mm. but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try harder next time. Uh, that is Sky Team, designed by Luc Ramond and published by Scorpion, Ma- Scorpion Masque. I share your misgivings about games where there are too many modules and you don't really know what the editorial vision is. You don't know what the way to play is. I do appreciate when a game can be sufficiently flexible to allow lots of modules, but have sufficient direction to structure them in scenarios. So right. one of the virtues yes. of the Sky Team is it's not that you decide whether or not you play with the fuel rule, rules or the mountain rules or the wind rules. You decide one of the airports you're trying to land at, and it comes with the modules that are appropriate for that particular scenario. That is a very important uh, distinction and, and probably why it is more much more palatable to be uh, to do it that way, for sure. So I got to play Ghost Blitz Mini. Ghost Blitz is one of my favorite party style family grabby games. Ghost Blitz is a game where you flip over a card and based on the combinations of the card, it's either going to tell you to grab a specific object. There are these five objects in the middle of the table. 
a rat, a ghost, a book, a bottle, and a chair. Or, by virtue of the card, it's going to instruct you to take uh, an object that is not representative of the card. Long story short, if the specific color and combination of item, so red chair, is on the on the card, you grab the red chair. But on the other hand, and this is where things get really tricky and people start sucking themselves out, which is great for a game of this ilk, it might be the case that nothing is accurately represented on the card. So instead, So you might have something like a red ghost and a blue bottle, which means that the gray mouse is not represented at all. And so you grab the gray mouse because the color and the shape is not on the card and nothing on the card exactly matches one of the items. And the first person to grab it wins and gets a, gets the card. If you grab something incorrectly, you lose a card. It's like jungle speed, but I find it much more civilized for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's much cuter. And number two, I've never seen a game of jungle speed end without physical injury to somebody because everyone's grabbing for the same totem in the middle. But in the context of, of Ghost Blitz, people are often grabbing for different things in the, the given case. I mean it. I, I've se- I haven't seen serious injuries in the context of Jungle Speed. But people tend to get scraped or scratched or, or bludgeoned a, a little bit. Minor bludgeoning. I would say that if you're not getting at least minor bludgeoning with Ghost Blitz, you're not doing it right. You need to, It's not quite as bad as Jungle Speed. But I, but my experience with Ghost Blitz, and I love Ghost Blitz, is we, you do get some fingernail scrapings and stuff like that, which which I think is... Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, are you it, sure it's fingernail scrapings and not you hurling a mouse at someone's forehead in frustration after <laughs> grabbing it incorrectly? Because I've never, I've never had any injuries from Ghost Interesting. Blitz. Interesting. Okay. Okay. That's wild. Have you played the mini version of Ghost Blitz? I have not. I didn't even know it existed until I looked it up uh, as you started uh, discussing it. It's this adorable four-inch size tin, and the, I, I was a little concerned about the cards, but they're eminently readable by everyone around the table, so it was marvelous. Yeah, my my only and and this I mean I feel like I'm such a big fan of Ghost Blitz that I'm certainly going to pick this up. But my only my only minor um, concern and concern is too strong a word is uh, I I see here that the things you pick up are are little tokens, sort of a la meeples sort of size things. Whereas with full size Ghost Blitz, the mouse is like a a larger sort of three dimensional, for lack of a better term, mouse. And the bottle is a three dimensional bottle, and, and there's some you know character to those. And these, while the mouse is a mouse shaped little flat you know token that that seems to be the the only thing that uh that you you lose going to this mini version but i'm you know still definitely going to get it you do lose a lot of that personality you're absolutely right there's a little bit of screen printing detail on the items but that doesn't nearly compensate for the fact that the original ghost splits materials were just very very cute and had a lot of immediate table presence one of the items actually the book is only distantly related to its inspiration. I mean, the other ones look like they're supposed to look. The green bottle looks like a bottle. The ghost looks like a ghost. The chair actually looks like a chair. Uh, but the book doesn't look much like a book. Anyway, but this is a, this is a minor issue. If this were the if there were an edition of a similar size for another Jacques Zeme, Zach Verlag classic, specifically Cockroach Poker, I would leave it in my purse all the time. And I, so I, I, I wish there, they make a similar mini version. There are three Zock games that are in this form factor. And Ghost Blitz is one of them, but no other by, by uh, Jacques Zeme. And I think Cockroach Poker would be perfect for this because it's just a deck of cards, so you'll lose nothing. And if they do that, then it will join R, a.k.a. Brave Rats, and Regicide as games that live perpetually in my purse. So I, I very much hope they do this. But Ghost Blitz is wonderful. You'll be happy to know, uh, those of you in So Very Wrong About Games Land, uh, that more details on this to follow, that, but that Michael Walker might be revolutionizing the approach of OT and physical therapy uh, by virtue of introducing all these hobby games to various people involved in his healthcare team who are very, very taken by things like Ghost Blitz and by Paku Paku <laughs> and other games of that ilk for people recovering from uh, various debilitating ailments. And this was the first experience that a bunch of people had with Ghost Blitz, which is wild because I've I've been Ghost Blitzing for years and I think it's <laughs> fabulous. And it's shocking how it's just the right level of confusion. The cards yeah. are just the right level of obfuscation. You think it's simple or you think it's impossible. and But no, it's just that right level where you can kind of get into a groove, but you're still going to get tripped up and grab the wrong item, and someone's like, no, actually, it's the other thing. And sometimes it happens immediately. Sometimes you grab it immediately, and you're right, and you move on. Sometimes it's 15 seconds later, and you're not really arguing about it, because, again, they're so simple, but people just miss it, because yeah. they get so focused on the wrong detail. It's 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 genius. Ghost Blitz is one of the best sort of party games that I know of. It is absolutely the best of the grab-it-right-away games that I, that I know of. And in terms of pattern recognition, it's my favorite way to do it. Jacques Zemmour, I think, is some kind of genius. 
Ghost Blitz is one of those games where uh, multiple times, I think specifically with Ghost Blitz, it's three times that I've played it, where right after we finish playing, somebody will ask me either, where can I get this or can I borrow your copy? Uh, literally just about a month ago, I brought out Ghost Blitz with more, again, hobbyist gamers um, who generally tend to, you know, not like these kind of games. Snubs. or, or snub, <laughs> Sure, exactly. Snubs. Snubs. Exactly. It's fair, fair. Um, and uh, one of them, as soon as we finished playing, was, can I ask me if he could borrow my copy and uh, brought it back a couple weeks later saying it was a huge hit with his family. So, um, yeah, love Ghost Blitz. Fantastic game. Finally, I played another game of Arcs. This is by Cole Worley and later games. I still don't know what to make of Arcs, man. I mean, I, so I'm only two games in. I'm only two games into Arcs. I haven't tried the expansion. This was the first time I played with leaders and lore, for what it's worth. I don't think they added considerably to any degree of confusion. It's just the cold worldliness of it all. I, I say this not even necessarily as a criticism. It's just his his games, as a rule, are sufficiently opaque in a whole bunch of novel ways. Not that the rules are particularly daunting, although sometimes they are. Not that the victory conditions are incredibly obtuse, although sometimes they are a little. But it's just, they're, they're always so verging on iconoclastic and so different from everything else. It's one of the reasons why, as somebody so deep in the hobby, I very much appreciate that there are people like Cole Worley working in the hobby and releasing games. I'm just never really sure on the initial plays if I'm actually playing the game at all, really. This is way beyond, like playing as intended, much less playing well. I don't even know if I'm pulling levers in the way I'm supposed to be pulling levers, let alone doing anything intelligent or recognizable. I know that there are Cole Worley stands who just uh, love all his designs and think he's, he's a towering genius in the hobby. I'm not quite at that level. I very much appreciate his work. I'm very glad that he's in the hobby work. I'm looking forward to exploring arcs further. Uh, but in terms of his more accessible approachable work, I don't think Arcs qualifies. It's not as daunting as some of his earlier stuff, but it's nowhere near as transparent as things like Root. And even Root isn't exactly the most easy-to-table game in the world. But Arcs is just, everything just seems so attenuated. Getting getting to a position where you can score just seems like it's still way above my head. I'm going to need at least two or three more plays before I can make heads or tails of this thing. And even then, I don't know if I'm ever going to start getting into the mountain of extra rules and overall structure that the mini campaign expansion, the Blighted Reach, introduces. Your feelings about worldly designs echo mine uh, to a great extent. Um, I, I certainly appreciate the design. I certainly appreciate the uniqueness of the design. But I, I also often don't know if I'm pulling levers as intended. Um, sometimes I realize how the levers are intended and then realize I don't really like how those levers are being intended. <laughs> Specifically, I, and now, to be fair, I've not played John Company's second edition, but my, that was my overwhelming feeling with the original John Company. Um, it, it felt, it, you know, I have these, like, competitive tendencies when it comes to board games. I I, I want them, the, the competition is, is important to me, and the sort of role-playing nature of, of John Company, again, at least first edition, from what I understand, there's a lot of it in second edition, uh, is just sort of uh, not not my vibe when it comes to to gaming. And uh, But I, you know, on the other hand, a game like PAX Premier, where I, that I feel is a little more straightforward in terms of like, this is, at least once you start playing it, you, you have more of a feeling of what needs to be done to win and things are a little more analogous to what other board games uh, are like. Is it is that that is one that I the worldly games I enjoy the most? Uh, Root also being a, a game like that, I think, where it's a little more straightforward. Again, as you say, I I am happy that there is uh, that are designers that are you know going against norms when it comes to how games are designed. I think that's important. I think it it helps you know move the hobby along, but. For whatever reason, some of those choices don't necessarily work for me. I'm happy that that he has such a strong, devoted following. Um, but yeah, hit or miss for me. It's strange. I'm the other way around, actually. I think that John Company and John Company Second are probably my second favorite worldly designs after Root and Pax Pamir uh, both. I preferred the first edition for what it's worth for all its obtuseness. But Pax Pamir Second Edition was one of those instances where I just, I, I wasn't on, on board. I thought it was fine, but I, I I wasn't really feeling the attenuation between the victory conditions and the random draw. Uh, and I, without the sense of historical sweep that some of the more 
chromey stuff that he introduced in Pax Premier First Edition, especially with Kyber Knives. I felt that it was losing a lot of its character, and so I, at the end of the day, I was it was it was. In, in, if anything, not Cole Worley enough for me, which is sure. Very strange. Yeah, no, of course, yeah, but I see that. I, the, the the paradigmatic example for me of uh, a Cole Worley design where I just started to 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 see how it was working, at least to my satisfaction, and then realizing that I wasn't particularly interested in pursuing it was Oath. I kind yeah. of sort of was getting to see what was going on, and it's like mm, I don't think this is worth the time commitment and the the effort required, especially to table it with some of the same people over and over, but. Arcs, time will tell. I, I, I'm I'm more intrigued by arcs than I have been by a lot of other Cole Worley designs. Maybe it's because I just like space theming more. Maybe it's because the fundamental card play is kind of cute and and pretty transparent. It's driving an engine, which is much more difficult to understand and comprehend. But suffice to say, there will be more about arcs in the future. Those are the games we played last week. And now we're going to take a brief break to pay some bills. Going online without ExpressVPN is like not having a case for your phone. Most of the time you'll probably be fine, but all it takes is one drop and you'll wish you'd spent those extra few dollars on a case. Whenever you connect to a public network, like a restaurant or an airport, your private information is not secure. It only takes some cheap hardware and a small amount of knowledge to intercept whatever you're doing. ExpressVPN stops hackers from stealing your data. ExpressVPN has the security to give you peace of mind. It would take some serious tech over a billion years to get through ExpressVPN's encryption. And it's extremely easy to use and works on all kinds of devices. I was on the road recently, and I had to do a lot of work on unfamiliar networks. And since I use ExpressVPN, I didn't have to worry about having my personal info being stolen and sold. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash so wrong games. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash so wrong games, and you can get an extra three months free. ExpressVPN dot com slash so wrong games. And we're back. And now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So first of all, I'd just like to give a sincere thank you uh, both to Mark Basada as well as everyone else that has been helping us here at So Very Wrong About Games, Efka Bladukas and James Damas, a.k.a. Jimbo, of course. There have also been a lot of other people who've reached out with offers to help that I've had to, for a variety of reasons, mostly due to scheduling, say, you know, thank you very, very much, maybe sometime in the future. And I haven't been handling myself necessarily in the best, but it's been a time of stress. But suffice to say, everyone who sent in well wishes, thank you so, so much. If I've gotten back to you, or if I haven't gotten back to you, it's meant a great deal to me during this period. And it also means a great deal to Michael Walker. So thank you again for that. And now on to games news. So uh, there's one upcoming title that I'm interested in. Sometimes I get captured by flights of whimsy and am interested in acquiring or trying a game for no particularly good reason. And sometimes it works out okay. In this case, the game is Atlantis Exodus. So this is being co-designed by Konstantinos Karagiannis. And he is one of the co-designers of Dungeon Scrawlers, which is one of the games of the past few years about which I am ridiculously enthusiastic and have found some enthusiasts to share my joy with and a number of other people, some of them, as Mark Posada would call them, snobs, who have absolutely no interest in dungeon scrawling with me. But if uh, if the man made dungeon scrawlers, I'll try other stuff that he's done. And uh, the reason why, in addition to that, that I'm interested in trying Atlantis Exodus, eh, the theme is just, you know, you're rescuing people from Atlantis that's sinking. There's some various, you know, action selection, worker placement stuff, vaguely worker placement adjacent stuff going on, whatever. But it has, Mark, an apotheosis track. I cannot say no to an apotheosis track. <laughs> there have been tracks, far too many tracks over the pa- course of the past few years, but never to my knowledge an apotheosis track. So I am interested in giving Atlantis Exodus a try. It should be coming out from DLP Games, which is a publisher that has done some truly great stuff in the coming year or so. And finally, in terms of the news, I didn't mention this last week, despite the fact that it was a, an episode that is a multiple of five. Uh, we have a Patreon. If you enjoy what we do, if you want to support us producing free media, please do check us out at patreon.com slash swag. You can get ad-free episodes and more of my inane yammerings. So that is the news and why it doesn't matter. We are now moving on to our feature game slash topic, which is Captain Flip. Captain Flip was designed by Remo Consadori and Paolo Mori, published by Playpunk this year. Paolo Mori is a long-standing favorite of So Very Wrong About Games. His output, like... Dogs of War and Blitzkrieg and Ethnos are some of the perennial favorites around here. And this is a bit of a departure from his traditional design aesthetic. 
Uh, Mark, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Captain Flip? In Captain Flip, you are drawing tiles and you are potentially flipping the tiles and you're placing those uh, flipped or unflipped tiles on your boat. You, uh, If you see gunners, because they're worth the most, you should play as many gunners as you can. Uh, le- <laughs> uh, if you see the map man, leave the map man to me because I like the map man. Uh, and that's how you pay, play, play Captain Flip. Yeah, that definitely characterizes a lot. So we've been playing a lot of Captain Flip on Board Game Arena. And mostly we've been trash talking each other about how gunners are the way to go. So the entirety of Captain Flip is pretty much in the tile effects. That's that's more or less it. There are different boards. Whenever you place a tile, it goes at the bottom of a given column. And there might be different bonuses for completing a column first or completing a column flat. Like columns of different size. This column has four tiles that it can hold. And if you finish it first, you get four points. If you finish it afterwards, you get two. Or maybe it's just you get three points for finishing it, regardless of whether you finish it first or later. Or if you complete a a column with all the same type of tile, there's sometimes a bonus. Or different tiles are sometimes a bonus based on that. Yes, the former of those I would characterize as a trap. Because (laughs) (laughs) three of the same... Oh, jeez. So, okay... (laughs) Look, I will put three. I will put. Look, if you give me a, a column with four of the same, and I can put four map men on there, I'm putting four map men on there. That's what I'm doing. Okay, yeah. So let's. Okay, <laughs> you want to talk about gunners? You want to talk about map men? What do you want to talk about, man? Like, <laughs> sorry, you you, 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 cut, you cut out there. I, I I missed what you said. Sorry. You want to talk about gunners? You want to talk about map men? What do you want to talk about, man? Like just the look, these tiles, man. I don't know what look, to do. Look, I I like this game. I think this is charming, and I like the I I like the fact that you know different tiles allow for you know strategy feels like too strong of words so or tactics i, I guess would is say better so word. yes yes tactics i i apologize for bringing up the word strategy um no no it's fine <laughs> Just... yeah no 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 uh but so i you know there is i keep bringing up map men but the idea with that is uh if there if you have a cartographer i like to refer to them as map men uh on your board you you pull this uh you pull this map that can be uh, tug a ward around the table and you get a point at the end of every round but more importantly for me at least is if you play a bunch of these uh, cartographers out and then you play a captain tile you get a multiple of points based on the number of of um cartographers you have but there is a high risk high risk being can feels too, every, every time i use like a very strong word it feels too strong for <laughs> this game. but uh, there is a risk that you're not going to pull enough captain tiles to make it worth it or you're not going to pull any at all or or you know a number of different things but i still like that little shot of adrenaline i get where okay i'm going down this path let me let me go for it or as i mentioned before the gunners gunners are the tiles that are on their own worth the most points however if you have three at the end of the uh, game uh, on your board three or more you uh, it's an auto loss condition and so there is that okay am i going to run the gunner's strategy am i going to try to even have them be four at one point but i'll i'll use another tile to flip them back down face down you know there's a little there's those little shots of adrenaline or excitement that you get for a game that is so fast and so simple that i appreciate it. again it's not going to you know it's not a, a brain burner in any respect um, and if you're looking for that you know keep looking but uh, but i i appreciate um, the different ways to that you can sort of play although luck is again a big big part of it yeah, so I I agree with the fact that any strong modifier or any strong word or any intense characterization, uh, I think can only apply to that last statement you did, which is that luck is a big factor, which is fine. I don't mind heavily luck-driven games. But, for example, let's talk about those map men. So there's a variety of ways you can get the map. One of the ways is, in some boards, people start with the map. So congratulations, good for them. And in other contexts, completing a column gives you the map. In other contexts, just a single type of tile. Well, in all contexts, actually, a single type of tile, the map then gives you the map. You might endeavor, in a variety of contexts, to exert considerable effort to wrest the map from your opponent. And then, maybe, they're going to pull a map man the next turn, or maybe they're never going to see a map man again. And the point, my, my objection to here, again, isn't necessarily a sense of imbalance or even a sense of too much luck being involved, it's a sense of frustration, right? Because uh, let's talk specifically about the first map. So let's say player one and player two are playing in the first map. Player two starts with, with, with uh, sorry, the first board, I should say. Map means something else. And player two starts with the map. Player one's like, all right, I'm going to race up that left-hand column to take the map away from the player. They do it. They've worked towards it. That was part of their, uh, one might even say in the satellite terms, their <laughs> strategy. 
<laughs> and then the second player just pulls a map man right away. And then maybe the first player pulls a map man again. Who knows? Like yeah. sometimes it's hot potato. Sometimes you work for it and it's just, it, it, it slips in your face, which again, ain't a huge deal. It's just insofar as Captain Flip offers you any sort of horizons past the immediate, I think they are illusory and apt to provide some degree of frustration. And that I don't think is ideal. Yeah. I mean, to uh, put another example out there in terms of the frustration, I mean, there is very little more frustrating in uh, Captain Flip than that initial tile. So when you very, at the beginning of a game, you draw a tile Hmm. and say it's the one where only scores points if it's the very top of a column. And, and, you know, for most maps, you... Uh, the, the top of the column requires more than one tile, so it's worth nothing. And then you flip that tile, and it ends up being like a, a tile that flips other tiles, and you have no other tiles to flip. And when uh, th- that ha- that has happened to me, I've played this game quite a few times, that has happened you know, more than a neg- negligible amount of times, and it's always quite frustrating because there's there's literally nothing you could have done. There's You know, you, you started with a, with a bad tile, and you're sort of out of luck. Part of what frustrates me about Captain Flip is that I think there is some good stuff there that points to how a different tile mix could have made the game substantially better at no additional rules overhead. Because I just like to echo something I, echo something I said with Efka last week. Yeah, your turns are simple, but at the end of the day, your score, what you're actually doing in Captain Flip, is driven by this player aid explaining to you what all the different tiles do. That's the point of information overload, where some people are apt to find the complexity. And, you know, for, for, for hobbyist gamers, it ain't no thing. But we tend to over-exaggerate. This is a point that I, I read made by Eric Lang. We overemphasize how simple your turns could be and underemphasize where the, the actual complexity lies, which is the actual victory condition. So if your turns are easy, but their consequences are complicated and detail-laden, that's going to alienate non-hobbyist gamers far, far more than a slightly more involved turn structure, but at least where everything is, is more transparent. But anyway, some of the interactions I really like, like the interaction between carpenters and gunners i think that's great especially since you get to play with the spatiality of the boards you know you put out a gunner that's taking a risk you're taking a risk that if you put out two two or more uh, gunners after that you're going to lose it's also the case you can look at the board and figure okay a carpenter gives you points only if they're not in the same row or column as a gunner and so you can look at the the situation on your board and say well if i pull a gunner or a carpenter next turn after placing a carpenter or gunner am i setting myself up for disaster and so well disaster Lost, <laughs> lost opportunity points. Right. Well, no, there is disaster in the form of three or more gunners. But, sure, sure. And those parts are neat. And I'm wondering yeah. why they didn't provide make a tile set that leaned into those kinds of things a little bit more. I don't think that would have complicated the end game scoring too much. You've already got a lot of the, the standard hobbyist tropes like triangular scoring and check the column and and score row and uh, count the number of X's every time you score Y. Like. There are some moments of interest and, and and intrigue in Captain Flip. It's just I find them few and far between. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Again, I think that is mitigated by the fact that it's such a quick game. Um, and, and, you know, there's an argument to be made that even a quick game, if it's wasting your time, is, is not worth it. Um, I'm, I've yet to hit that that point. I still, I still have uh, enjoyed playing it. Again, this is a game that is aided to me by the fact that I, I've played it uh, only on BGA. I don't know if I yep. would have the same sort of uh, patience with it uh, if I played it in person. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't imagine that there's much setup involved. They're basically, I guess, throwing all the tiles in a bag. Um, but even that, even the, the setup and teardown um, might might be grading. Um, if I if it's like, say, I, had a, I was playing this on a game night with people that I, you know, we're, this is our one game night a week and we're playing Captain Flip. And I have that first tile pull, and it's a it's a dead tile. Like that that is much more impactful to me than than a, a, a two second issue on BGA. Um, so yeah, a game probably that is that suffers in person. I as well have only played on the BGA. I would never consent to play a game like this in person because yeah, it's not going to be too too long, but you're still passing around a tile, and it's completely multiplayer solitaire. Yeah. Other than those few instances of trying to steal the map back and forth, which as we've, we've acknowledged can feel very, very arbitrary and sometimes seems beside the point. And it compares, like, I, I, I realize I compare so many games to this one. I'm sorry, it's a cliche, but it's appropriate. I can't help but comparing it to Raw. Raw has all the same joys 
of pulling a tile out from the bag, of gambling with that, of engaging in risk, but there are actual trade-offs involved. And here, here's, here's a big thing in terms of the social experience of playing Raw. Every pull matters to everyone at the table. As opposed to Captain Flip, where I've played it even on BGA with more than two people, and even then it felt like a waste of time. Past two players is just painful as far as Captain yeah. Flip is concerned. Yeah. And when you contrast that to games that are able to leverage that, because people talk about all this time, all the time in the context of games like Captain Flip or Quacks of Quedlingburg, or uh, sometimes also slightly differently with Sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, there are these moments of drama and reveal and surprise. And it's like, oh, sure. But is this of, of salience to the rest of the table? Is it anything more than arbitrary? Are you able to make this so that the, the it still moves at a good clip? Because pacing and consequence to the rest of the people at the table matters a lot for these kinds of games. And this is why I made the, 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 the bit of, I mean, satire sounds like too big of a word, but this is why I keep joking about roll a six when a cookie. I seriously think that hobbyist games need to equal or exceed the drama and excitement <laughs> of something like roll a six when a cookie. No, I mean it. Yeah, uh, no, I get it. You're a- you are absolutely right, my good man. There is a joy in rummaging around to the tile and just pulling it out and seeing what you get and then making the extra gamble to flip it, maybe or not. But this, in the same way that there is a simple, atomistic, pri- almost primal joy of just chucking dice trying to get the right result. I am not going to poo-poo that. That is absolutely a joy. But the problem is, when I'm pointing at something like Captain Flip and saying, it's fun to just pull tiles, my response is always going to be the same. But you can still pull tiles and get that same joy out of far better experiences. And I can roll dice and get cookies when playing roll a six when a cookie, as opposed to pulling tiles and feeling like I wasted my time in a game of Captain Flip. Wasting my time is a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll concede. I just don't think it's doing much with what it, what it has on offer. That, that's fair. That's certainly fair. And and, and Raw is a great uh, counterexample of a game that has the same trappings, but done much, much better and much, much more rewardingly, I would say. But speaking of rewarding, like, I, I think, at least I can, fool myself into thinking that while this is all random and, and while that, again, that first pile of frustration can be terrible, you know, I, I place four ma- um, map guys out there and and then get the captain. And I think to myself, you know what? I don't think many people would have done that. Like I, I you know, I, bra- <laughs> I, I, bra- I, I went the brave route. I put the, uh, or I put the third gunner out there. Everybody was telling me that this was a fool's, fool's errand, and yet I did that. And and again, if you analyze it for two seconds, you realize that you know there wasn't much there. Um, but but in the moment, in the moment, again, I'm going to strictly say on BGA. Um, you know, it's it gives me the shot, uh, and and I can self deceive in a way that, that that feels worth it to me. But I I certainly uh, get your point. Not too often do we use the word hero. But you, Mark, <laughs> are the hero that we need. But look, I'm not I'm not going to assert. I don't have an opinion one way or the other as to whether or not uh, as to how much skill there is in Captain Flip. I sincerely don't know. It could be the case. Because these things are deceiving. Like, again, people dismiss, people think that Dominion is, uh, you know, a pure game of skill. They're exaggerating. People dis- dismiss Raw as being purely random. They're grossly exaggerating. Raw, I find, very deterministic in terms of higher uh, higher skilled players. Uh, I-, I don't know to what extent a more skilled player of Captain Flip will win. It could be 100% of the time. I mean, if, that wouldn't shock me necessarily. Right. It's more in terms of the play experience. And you're absolutely right. There are moments of tremendous satisfaction pulling map guy just when you need him. Getting that second cannoneer or getting a monkey to flip over your third cannon. Like that that's great. You know, very very enjoyable pleasant experiences. Are they as pleasant as eating a cookie after rolling a 6? Mm, I don't know. Not to belabor the point. Like we're, we're again, we're talking about a very very narrow use case. Yeah. Two players BGA. Yes. I don't True. Yeah. I, I and this, I think, is a good segue into the, the, to the broader uh, uh, topic of, of the SDJ, because it was nominated for Spiel des Jahres. It didn't win. Uh, the, the, the winner was Sky Team. And I'm of two minds about the SDJ. One of them is that despite the fact that I my own snobbish tendencies tend to, whenever I'm not paying attention, characterize the winners in a negative light, when I actually look at the games that have won the SDJ... It's a good list, I gotta say. Uh, I, I I only quibble with a couple of them. 
I just yeah. over the course of the past few years. Sky Team is, is I think, is a very good game, although I'll, I'll get back to it in a second. Dorf Romantic is, is very pleasant. Cascadia, eh, not to my taste, but I can certainly understand it. Micro Macro Crime City, an odd choice, given how it's not necessarily family-friendly, but I think it's a, a marvelous experience, etc., etc. Pictures, a eh, bit, of, bit of a miss. Um, you know, Hanabi was 10 years ago, grant you, but there's code names. I mean, look, there's a lot of great stuff on the SDJ list. I, like many snobs, will say we're a long way from 1990, uh, 1996 when El Grande won, and they will never in a million years, well, million years, without a substantial reevaluation of their priorities, they're not going to award a game like El Grande ever again. I distinctly remember when Carcassonne won in 2001. Uh, that was just when I was getting into the hobby, and I heard I was hearing all the hobbyist board gamers talk about how this was the lightest game that the SDJ had ever... That this was too light, that it was too simple. What, what are they doing? Of course, they should have saved their outrage for the next year when Villa Paletti won. Have you played Villa Paletti? I have not. I'm familiar with it, but I've never played it. I love Dexterity Games. I adore Dexterity Games. Villa Paletti is so weak. <laughs> it is <laughs> not. I think of the list, I've played nearly every game that has won the SDJ for the past 25 years. And uh, Villa Paletti is definitely the one that stands out to me as not deserving of the prize. But anyway, so it's a good list. I think it's a great list. But the second thing that I have to say is I have no conception about what is apt to attract the attention of the SDJ jury. Yeah. None. Because just going back again to the same discussion, Sky Team is a two player only game. I thought we were here for family games. Which is fine. Like I don't know what family yeah. games do well or why. I don't know why Sky Team got won. I think it's a great game. I just wouldn't have thought that it, w- it would fit. Same thing with Micro Macro Crime City. Because, uh, look, it's not like it's it's redolent in sex, drugs, and alcohol. Uh, but, you know, it's not exactly the kind of thing that I would want to pull out with five, six, seven-year-olds in attendance. Because I wouldn't know what the specific case has to deal with. So, when, when I just look, I, I just don't know what they're doing anymore. Which is fine. They don't have to be a, a catering to me. Do you have a better sense of... of the SDJ's priorities and, and, and values? No, I, I can't say that I do. Uh, I remember I got into the hobby basically around the time when they separated the uh, SDJ to the... Uh, the the uh, Kinnerspiel? Yeah, the Kinnerspiel. And um, I remember... I, I Look, I've always been a fan of lists or awards i know it's it can be very reductive and it, and it can be it, it's silly on a lot of really? levels are you mark of board game barrage a fan of lists do you like listing <laughs> uh-huh. things and relisting things i didn't know that <laughs> look i will say we list things i don't know if we relist things i think we're i think we're we, we are careful not to relist but you but your point is would made. you your characterize point. your love of listing as your 43rd favorite thing like you did last year or your 47th <laughs> favorite thing as you do this year well, I'll have, to, I'll have to put both of them into Pub Meeple and then see where yep. it falls uh, sure. in a very exhaustive way. Um, but no, I will say that I, I, part of me just thinks that there is a like human, like visceral desire to list things or to categorize things. And and maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I'm right. I don't know. But I I just I like lists. I like lists. I like top lists. And so um, when when I got into the hobby and I saw there was this oh this this is the most prestigious award. This is the game of the year. I. I did have those. Oh, what are they doing? They're doing, you know, Quirkle is going to be the, is the game. Like, how, how is that the game? Like, yeah. I'm only, I'm new to the hobby, but I, you know, I can buy Quirkle at the local store. How could that be the game of the year? And then, and then yeah, no, no, no I agree. Look, look, look. <laughs> the gates I, I, there are being kept. I, I say this as the person who has uh, moved past that line of thinking, sure. you know, for sure. But, and then there was the, you know, the uh, Kinnerspiel, the, the, what they call the connoisseur game of the year, the more like, you know, yeah. uh, advanced game. And, you know, there was Seven Wonders. And even then I had problems with it, again, being a, like an oh, idiot yeah. back then. Um, but but now I, I you know, I, I don't know what the criteria is. Your point about Sky Team being a two-player game and, and you know, it seems like family has always been the, the most important part of, again, at least the Spiel winners. Uh, and then why we'll, have a two-player game. So it's hard to understand or hard to, to put my finger on what they're exactly going for. But I will agree with you that that it is a good list. Like, you know, Quirkle is a fantastic game, you know, uh, Code Name, oh, yeah. all these all these all these great games, both in the the regular uh, award and the Connoisseur Game Award. You know, although the list is maybe not indicative of what I would pick as the games of the year, 
I don't think that's important. I think you can do that in our board game barrage top fifty games of all time every year. A uh, <laughs> little plug, uh, but 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 more importantly, I, I you wow. know what what I what I've what I have appreciated about these games, th- there tends to be for the most part, and, and it's hard to paint with a broad brush, but these games are generally simple to teach. I think that's one yes. you know commonality, and they are generally at least recently they seem to be. Ex- accessible not only in a teaching way but just they they seem to be family friendly maybe you know micro macro being maybe an exception but they're they are colorful they are you know sort of cozy to use an overused term in our in our hobby recently um but but they 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 sort of act as a um and i i mentioned this earlier like when i have folks over who see my you know this crazy board game collection i have and are interested in playing, but again, maybe not hobbyists and maybe not, you know, looking for a 45 minute rules teach. I can say to them, hey, uh, this game was nominated for game of the year a couple of years ago, or this game won game of the year. It's something that, you know, piques their interests and, and it makes it, it sort of like, you know, will make them more interested in, in playing it. It's it sort of like heightens those experiences or, you know, affords some sort of like importance to the experience that maybe it's not even deserving of, but, you know, people think, oh, I went to Mark's house and we played the game of the year. And it's like sort of a fun thing. It's like, it's something that I've always appreciated from from going to these lists. I can, I know that, okay, I've got a couple people over, they want to play a co-op game. Let me look at the Spiel games. Maybe this will be a good indication of what games to bring up. Yeah, that's entirely fair. I'd also like to add just a, one more note about my vague befuddlement about Sky Team. Not only is it a two-player game, it's a two-player game where you're seldom allowed to talk, which also is a sure. weird... I mean, yeah. even as a hobbyist, I don't really like that. I mean, I, I, I'll happily play... Hanabi was another game where you're not really allowed to talk. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I think Hanabi's brilliant, but I also wouldn't necessarily have thought that it was a, like, deduction, no talky game? Family? Mm, all right, fine, yeah. whatever. Uh, another thing I'll note about the quality of the list over the past 20 years is that there's not a whole lot of stereotypical, frowny, sepia-toned, European-slash-colonialist themes, which is also yeah. great. I mean, good for them. They've been avoided. There, there are smat, like Turn in Taxis and El Grande, they're smatting over there, but not really colonialist necessarily. But so there, there's not a sort of Eurocentric focus necessarily, even though the designers tend mostly to be German or European in terms of who wins. But I'll, I'll just to elaborate your, your thing about the cachet of being able to put something in front of somebody and say this one game of the year, which I think is, and I mean this flatteringly, I don't mean this as an insult, which is good marketing. You know, they call yeah. themselves the game of the year, which isn't really fully accurate, but whatever, you get to call yourself whatever you want. They got their yeah. first, it's game of the year, good for them. But the other thing that, it, that it's very good at is it's in a fractured hobby, even in the context of hobbyist gamers, in a fractured niche-driven hobby, it's an opportunity for all of us snobs to get on the same page. And to be talking about the same things for about half a second, right? Yeah. We yeah. played Captain Flip because it was nominated for the SDJ. You know, people who hadn't played Sky Team or Captain Flip or In the Footsteps of Darwin might have been inclined to go seek it out. And in a, in a, in a hobby where hundreds and hundreds of games every year are competing for your attention, it's nice to have a cultural moment that's shared across a lot of people and even internationally. You know, the same thing happens for what it's worth when the Academy Award puts out his list of, of best picture. It's like nobody thinks that the Academy actually identifies the bestest movies over the course of the year. But for film snobs and for people who are enthusiasts about film more broadly, not that everyone who's enthusiastic about film is a snob, you, get, you take my point. It's an opportunity for everyone to be talking about the same movies for a little bit. And I, I think there is some value to that in the hobby. And so I don't begrudge them that. It's just, just to be perfectly clear, I'm just generally mystified. I'm not skeptical. I'm just kind of like, you know, they put out their list and indeed they satisfy all these criteria generally. Sometimes they don't like Sky Team and I get a little confused. It's just, okay, so this this is what we're going to be talking about this year. Yeah. And I just have no ability to predict what that's going to be. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And uh, to your point about... Um, you know, making this a, a cultural touch point or something we can talk about. Uh, that's another thing I uh, I agree with. And I, you know, while I, you know, I I feel like I've I've changed, you know, uh, evolved from those earlier uh, feelings about these lists that I that I mentioned earlier. Nowadays, when I hear people complaining about, you know, oh, this isn't this isn't the game of the year. You know, you know, this it's certainly not having hmm. enough to be game of the year. Um, yeah. I, part of me is like, you know, we talk about for you know for good or ill, growing the hobby. 
and this yeah. allow this allows us to to have something to talk about. This is like absolutely you know add some buzz to to our you know this thing we all share. And we talk about wanting to introduce more people and bring more people in. And this seems like a very fun, easy, you know, shallow perhaps almost certainly, but but way to to, to sort of drum some of that up. And you know, I, I take that for what it is. I take it for you know we're just here to like these are simple games. Or these are you know. These are games that are are approachable and, you know, exactly. let's just take it for that. Yeah. Like I said, marketing. It's good marketing yeah. for the hobby. Yeah. It's good marketing for, you know, and, and, and yes, there's a lot of money involved. You shouldn't ignore that. Uh, you know, slap that SDJ sticker on your box and you're going to move a whole bunch more cardboard. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I have no reason to believe that the process is corrupt. I have no reason to believe that the process is illegitimate. It's just not one whose principles I understand, which yeah. is fine. Yeah. Because on the back end, although I, you know, obviously I should note, I could quibble each year, even based on just the specific nominees. X should have won over Y or A should have been nominated or whatever. Obviously I can do that. You know, as someone with my gaming predilections, the fact that Reiner Knizia has won the SDJ once seems very strange to me because yeah. <laughs> I think Reiner Knizia has done an awful lot of stellar work over the course of the past 25 years alone in terms of amazing family weight games that I would rather recommend and play over a lot of these things. But again, that's not the point, right? Ultimately, I think it's 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 a good cultural moment and it's good marketing. And then there's the Kenner spiel. I don't think it gets all the same virtues that the SDJ does. And my confusion goes up to 11. Because I look at the Kenner spiel list, I'm like, okay, so this year was a good year. I think I think Daybreak by Matt Leacock and Matteo Menapache, I think it's good. I don't know what their threshold is for, for, for Kenner. Uh, but Daybreak, I can look at and say, oh, okay, it's, you know, vaguely hobbyist. I, I, uh, it's, it's, it's more complicated than Sky Team. Yeah. It's a harder thing to teach than Kakasun. Okay, fine, whatever. But I look over this list, it just seems all over the place. Like, there's stuff that would have been an SDJ nominee 20 years ago. There's stuff that I think seems even lighter than the SDJ winner. Like, frankly... Uh, between like just look at last year between yeah. Dorf Romantic and Challengers, like which is what a on earth game. is going on? Yeah, it's so bizarre. I I I I just don't get it at all. Absolutely correct. I I mean it's again it just feels like one of those things where you just throw your hands up and and just you know uh, realize that that the distinction is never is not going to be clarified if there is one and and what the terms of the yeah. distinction are uh you know it just is it's just going to be nebulous and uh yeah i i agree yeah challengers versus dorf romantic which one is even the more complicated one yeah i i uh, absolutely agree with that and again there are lots of games on this list that i think are very good i mean it's great that they finally gave the award to someone who uh isn't a dude in 2019 so congratulations to elizabeth hargrave you know one of the many many awards she picked up for wingspan that's great the crew is on the list which is fabulous you know good for them but i don't know man I just, yeah it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me <laughs> yeah like the exit games in 2017 that's that seems like a strange inclusion anyway i again i i I I will never understand them. I don't think uh, I I know whenever the nominees are are released and I hear the nominees are released, I go in thinking like, okay, I, I I'm not going to get it. Like I I already have a <laughs> sense that like it's just it's going to be sort of like a a surprise to me no matter what. And there's some there's some fun to that. I remember when the game was nominated, I had heard nothing about it. Um, you know, in addition to acting as a thing to talk about, it, it acts as a you know maybe clue into what's to come because these are games nominated, I guess, based on the year they were published in Germany. And so sometimes it's sort of fun to uh, hear about these games that are maybe off your radar because they haven't been published in the U S yet or the can Canada yet. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, th that's, that's always like a little bit of a, a fun little bit to it, but you know, the weight of the award uh, is maybe something that is not, you know, important to me or the gravity of it. Uh, but I'm still, I'm still happy for for what it does to the hobby. Very well put. So that's going to do it for this week for so very wrong about games. Mark Basada from Board Game Barrage, thank you so, so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. I can't help but notice you're wearing some kind of merch. Do you have anything to plug? Uh, I, I'm always plugging. Uh, this is a, a Board Game Barrage t-shirt. Uh, I won't be so crass as to say where you get that. But uh, if you... <laughs> I, I, look, I, I'm certainly crass, but perhaps uh, I'll try to tone it down a little bit. Uh, but yeah, no. Uh, if you... Um, 
want to hear more board gaming content, uh, we would love to have you listen to our show, Board Game Barrage. And it's been a pleasure. I have been a uh, fan all the way from days uh, of uh, all the games you like are bad. And so it is uh, completely my uh, pleasure and honor to be here. I uh, wish it was under better circumstances. But uh, yeah, love love the show. I uh, love both of you guys. And uh, thank you. No, Mark, thank you. We appreciate it tremendously. So thanks for spending your time with us here on So Far Know About Games. We hope to see you again soon. Please do take care of yourselves, take care of your hobby, and thank your rules explainer. Bye, everyone. Bye. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bickman. You can find all our information at SoWrongGames.com. Special thanks to What Does It Eat for allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our intro. You can find them at WhatDoesItEat.com. We hope to see you again soon, and as always, try to be right, but remember you're so very wrong. to Swag Presents Masterpiece Theater in honor of our dear patron. This week, our patron is a bit of a change. It is his grace, the right honorable Mark Basada III. This week, we are going to be talking about Ripley, the Netflix limited series. What are your thoughts on Ripley, Mark? Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for letting me uh, into this. Uh, this room is quite swanky, and I appreciate the robe This that you, Mark uh... is velvet, not velveteen. A gentleman knows the difference. <laughs> And with my, my initials on it, you guys really uh, go all out. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, uh, Ripley, I uh, I really really enjoyed it. It was a, a slow burn for me um, early on in the uh, series. And and for those who don't know, I didn't know going in that this is sort of another take on um, the talented Mister Ripley or the original Ripley books by um, um, by uh, Patricia Highsmith. And uh, so this is a retelling of of the story. Um, but a very beautifully shot movie, uh, show, a, be- a very beautifully shot show, um, very deliberate, I would say in its pacing, uh, very lovingly shot, um, and, and not like, uh, a lot of stuff that you, uh, are, is out there for, for consumption, I think nowadays and, uh, very much appreciate it. Yeah. It's a bit of a throwback in that a lot of it is just, let's have these beautiful shots of Italy. Uh, yeah, it's, right. it, it's strange yeah. because normally I'm not into that kind of thing. Because so much contemporary prestige television, the pacing is such a slog. Uh, but despite the fact that it's taking a story that has been told in a couple of different 90-minute movie adaptations and it stretches it out to several hours, I never felt that the pacing dragged too much. Partially, I think it's just how good the cinematography is. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm I'm with you. Like, uh, I usually am wanting things to move. I want the pace to, to, to sort of like take me along for the ride and early on in watching this you know com- combining the, the 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 slow pace these loving shots of of italy combined with the fact that it's entirely shot in black and white oh yeah I, early on early on i found myself thinking like if you're gonna do all these shots at least give me color at least <laughs> do, you know do something um and, and so at first i was a little you know standoffish i wasn't really uh it hadn't really gripped me and then uh, you know halfway through i i found myself when they would do another you know panning shot of hmm. of the uh you know countryside it was just so gorgeous that uh, i i found myself uh really enjoying it and again a reaction that i would not have expected for myself going into it so the lead actor andrew scott have you seen him in things before i uh have seen him a couple things i know him primarily from uh him playing moriarty in the original sherlock which is a character i i personally loved yeah um, so i thought- saw him first as hot priest in fleabag I didn't watch. Okay, yes, I'm aware of this. I I I didn't watch the the Sherlock. The, the, the Sherlock Holmes adaptation. I've only seen clips of him as in Moriarty, and oh my goodness, he's see- the the extent to which he's chewing on the scenery is so. Yeah. I I know a whole bunch of people who've only seen Andrew Scott in the Sherlock Holmes uh, adaptation, and they think he's a terrible actor, and right. I can kind of understand why. <laughs> He's he's certainly swimming in a river of ham. Uh, yeah, he's very very hammy. Yeah, but as I say, I've seen him in hot. He's he's brilliant as Hot Priest. He's brilliant as Ripley, and I also want to give a special attention to the brilliant performances of a half a dozen different incredibly bored and obnoxious hotel clerks. There's just a series. <laughs> there are all these scenes that just don't really serve much of just 
Ripley interacting with a whole bunch of hotel clerks that just look like they, they are so over all of this. It's mar I don't know where they found all these Italian character actors. It's presumably Italy, but it's great. <laughs> just like, and sometimes, yeah. and then later that same energy is given up by constables. Like all these conversations where it's like, well, but to find that, I'd have to leave my office. It's like, well, why don't you go do some police work then? <laughs> right, it's right. Great. Yeah, the uh, the uh, clerk quotient is quite high in this, as is the stairs. God, if you like stairs, <laughs> this is the yes. show for you. There's a lot of walking up and down stairs. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I think to that point, it is, to a great extent, like a show about process. Like, mm. both the process of detective work... Um, which you might expect in a sort of a thriller uh, like this, but also the the process of to use like a maybe more grotesque term that I want to like the process of murdering somebody like, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't think it, it's interesting because I don't think anybody in this show is, you know, supernaturally adept at what they're doing, be it the police force or Ripley himself, the, the you know, the murder at the, the heart of the story. Um, but you and you sort of well, part of the part of the languid nature of the show is like seeing these people go through the process of, you know, going to all the hotel clerks and asking them, be it if it's the constable or police officers or in Ripley's case, you know, the process of murdering, you know, the, the um, Dickie and, and how he has to try to figure out how to dispose of the body and how to get away from the, you know, mask his, his uh, moves and, 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 you know, get away from the, police chasing after him so um yeah just that that sort of process nature of the of the movie ties so well with the 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 deliberate pacing that i found those tied together very well yeah i i would definitely say if you saw the movie with matt damon <laughs> or didn't right. uh ripley for me is an easy recommend i think it's one of the best best executed pieces of television i've seen in a long time and the performances are all brilliant. The cinematography is brilliant. And the pacing, as you say, is languid, but nonetheless, not as draggy as pretty much every other major piece of prestige television. Yeah, I, I would uh, absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I think there are people who will bounce off of it um, just because of uh, the slow pacing and, uh, you know, the fact that it is primarily in Italian. And I know some people are not into like reading uh, while oh, they're sure. watching, but, but I would say... <clears throat> I would say uh, if you find yourself in that boat, um, pun not intended. Um, I, I would say I would say try to to, to give it as a bunch of a chance as you can because I think you will be rewarded um, once you get to the heart of it. Thank you for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games presents Masterpiece Theater in honor of His Grace the Right Honorable Mark Basada the Third. Take care, everyone.